now with probability theory under our belts, we're going to want to use that knowledge for the purpose of analyzing data sets or statistical analysis. And essentially, this analysis consists of collecting a sample from some larger population, then analyzing and studying the sample and being able to describe it. And based on this analysis, form conclusions or inferences based on the entire population from which the sample came. So as an example, let's suppose that I have some city and I want to find the average height of a person in this city. In order to do that with statistical analysis, I could collect a sample of 40 people. So the size of the sample is 40 elements, also denoted by lowercase n. So in this case, that's equal to 40. And in some cases, you may refer to as the elements of the sample as experimental units because you measure a variable from these units. In this case, we're going to measure the height of each person. Now it's important to note that in order to have an accurate estimation and to be able to use the tools we gain from probability, we have to collect the sample in a non-biased and random manner such that every single person that we pick had an equal chance of being selected. It's the same case where if you're flipping a coin and you want to use probability to estimate the the outcomes, it has to be a fair coin. There needs to be an equal chance of landing heads as landing tails. It's the same idea. Continuing on, let's suppose that after collecting my data, I find that the average height within my sample, so within my sample, I find that the average height denoted by x bar is equal to 1.7 meters. Assuming that the sample was collected in a proper manner, I can then conclude that the population should also have a population average denoted by mu similar or approximately equal to 1.7 meters. And that's why statistical analysis is so powerful since it allows you to form a conclusion about an entire population or a large data set from a smaller sample. In this case, we're only using it for one variable so in this case, we're using univariate data, or one variable. But statistics carries on for multiple variables, two, which is bivariate, and two or more, which is multivariate. One of the most common tools for statistical analysis are measures of essential tendency. And these are mainly used for univariate data sets, that is to say, we are only considering one variable at a time. And essentially, they consist of averages. And they tell you where the most frequent result is within your data set. So suppose I had a normal distribution. My mean, if it's a symmetric distribution, should be somewhere around the middle, which is also where my most frequent results lie. So the first form of a measure of central tendency is the one you're most common with. And it's the mean represented or denoted by x bar. And it's simply equal to the sum of all the points. So that's what that means, divided by however many points there are. So sum all points divided by how many there are. For example, let's suppose I had a data set that was 1.7, 1.8, 2.0, 1.7, and then 1.9. And let's just pretend that these represent nothing in particular, so they have no units attached. Then to calculate the mean of this data set, I would sum all the points. So 1.7 plus 1.8 plus 2.0 plus 1.7 plus 1.9. And then I'd notice that there are five points, so I'd divide by five, and I'd get a mean of 1.82, which is indeed somewhere near the middle of this data set. Now, the only problem with the mean is that if my set 
had a few extreme values. For example, let's suppose that most of the values lie in this region, but I had a few large values, which are sometimes called outliers. So extreme large values. In that case, instead of the mean being located near the most frequent measurements, it will be shifted towards the right, and thus it's going to be higher than I would expect and no longer representative of the data set, of the sample, and thus of the population. Likewise, the opposite happens if I have a lot of lower points. So let's suppose that my data set is towards the right, and I have a lot of points on the lower end. Then instead of my mean being located near the most frequent measurements, it's going to be shifted towards the left, and it's going to be lower than usual and biased to the left. So in the first case, we have a skewed right distribution, since we have a longer right tail. And in the second case, we have a skewed left distribution, since we have a longer left tail. In both cases, we can't really use the mean since it's really sensitive to the extreme values and it's going to be shifted very easily. Once it's shifted, it's no longer accurate. So in these cases, we're going to want to use another measure of central tendency called the median. And sometimes it's denoted by a lowercase m. And the median is simply the middle value within the data set. So going back to my, da or the ordered data set rather, the ordered data set. So going back to my data set over here, to find the median, first we would order all points from smallest to greatest. So 1.7, then 1.7, then 1.8, followed by 1.9, then 2.0. At that point, we'd find the middle value, which in this case is 1.8, and that's what we would call our median. Now, a more formal way to do this is that once you've ordered your set, the position of your median within the set is equal to 0 0.5 times however many points you have, so n, plus 1. So in this case, I have 5 points, so 0 0.5 times 5 plus 1 is equal to 0 0.5 times 6, which is 3. So the position of my median is the third point within the data set. This works nicely if you have an odd number of points. However, if you have an even number of points, then your median is going to come out to be a decimal. So let's suppose we remove the value of 2, and now we only have 4 data points. So the position of my median is going to be 0 0.5, times 4 plus 1, which is equal to 0 0.5 times 5, or 2.5. 2.5 isn't a whole number. So in that case, we're going to select the number that's halfway in between the second entry and the third entry. And that's the same thing as saying find their average. So in this case, the median would be the second entry plus the third entry divided by 2, which is equal to 1.75. So the median for the new data set would be 1.75. Now a last measure of central tendency that some may use is called the mode. And it doesn't really have a specific notation to use. Most people just use mode. And essentially the mode is the most frequent value or range of values within the set. So in the case for our sets, we can see that every value occurs once, except the value of 1.7, which occurs twice. So the frequency, or how many times the value 1.7 occurs, is greater than the frequency of the other points. And so my mode for my data set in this case would be 1.7. So it would be very useful to be able to determine the shape of a distribution, so whether it's symmetric, skewed right, or skewed left, 
without having to visualize its data set. And it turns out we can do that with our measures of central tendency. Since in the case of a symmetric distribution, where we have a mean that the set is centralized upon and symmetric about both ends, in that case, my middle value or my median is going to be at the exact center. My average or my mean is also going to be at the center. And my most frequent value is going to be around there or also exactly at the center. And so all three values are going to be pretty close together or equal. So in the case of a symmetric distribution, my mean is going to be equal to my median, which is going to be equal to my mode, or approximately so. In the case where I have some extremely large values, so I have a skewed right distribution, then my mode is also going to be located at the peak, so it's still going to be around the center. My median is going to be the middle value, and so it's going to be slightly past the mode or equal to the mode. So it's going to be slightly to the right of the mode. And my mean is very sensitive to extreme values, and so it's going to be skewed to the right along with the distribution. And so in the case of a skewed right distribution, my mean is going to be greater than my median, which is going to be greater than or perhaps equal to my mode. But in most cases, it will be greater than the mode. The opposite occurs if we have a left skewed or a skewed left distribution. My mode is still going to be where the peak of the distribution is. My median is going to be the middle value, and so it might be a little bit to the left of the mode. And my mean is going to be heavily influenced by the low values. So it's going to be shifted to the left. So in this case, my mean is going to be less than the median, which in most cases is going to be less than the mode, but might be equal. Now, as great as it is to be able to find the center of a distribution, we still want to know how the data is distributed around that center. So how the data is distributed around the center. That is to say, we could have two distributions with the exact same mean. However, one could be localized or very central to the mean, while the other might be very much spread out. And we want to be able to identify and describe both these cases. So the most simple way to do that is by finding the range denoted by the letter R. And it's simply equal to the maximum value of the set minus the minimum value of the set. And that'll give you a sort of width of possible values. So if we return to our previous example, our, our maximum was 2.0 and our minimum was 1.7. And so our range would be 0 0.3. The width of all possible values is 0 0.3. The problem here is that we could still have outliers within our set. So maybe we have one large value. Then the range is going to be large but my data still might be centralized or very focused and concentrated around my mean. And so a more detailed and accurate value to use is called the variance, denoted by lowercase s squared. And the variance essentially gives you a value that is proportional to the average distance of all points from the mean or from x bar, we should say. And the calculation that we can use is s squared is equal to the sum of these distances from each point to the mean. The problem here is that some points are going to be less than the mean, while others are greater than the mean. And so this difference can be positive or negative. And then adding these positive or negative values is going to cause them to cancel out giving us an inaccurate result. So what we do is we make all of them positive by squaring them, hence the s squared. And then we divide by n minus 1, since that usually gives us results that are more comparable or more accurate to the variance of the actual population. And a shortcut for this calculation 
or another way to write it, is the sum of all the points squared. So we square all the points and then add them together. Minus however many points there are, so lowercase n, times the mean of the set squared divided by n minus 1 once again. And it's important to note that in both cases we have to use the mean. So even if the data is skewed and the mean isn't a clear representation of its center, we can't use the median, we still have to use the mean. However, that usually isn't a big problem for the variance. Now squaring the value usually gives us results that aren't very comparable to our data set. For example, let's suppose that I'm looking at the heights of individuals, then my data set is going to have units in meters, and my variance is going to be in meters squared. And the value for the variance isn't going to be very close to the values I have within the set. So what we do is we square root the variance, and we get a value called the standard deviation. denoted by s, and this is equal to the square root of the variance, or the square root of the sum of all the square differences between the points and their mean, divided by n minus 1. And this value also, also represents the spread of the data, however it's going to be more comparable to the values found within the set. So now we have an example to practice using all these values. We want to interpret the following data set for the amount of pocket change carried by individuals found in Times Square. So essentially we want to find the measures of central tendency as well as the measures of spread for the set. So we'll start with the measures of central tendency, of which the first is the mean. So we'll start by summing all the points, so 50.71 plus 79.62 plus 60 plus 71.01 plus 400 divided by however many points there are, which in this case there are 5, and that gives us a mean of $132.27. And right away you can tell something is off since only one of our points is even greater than 100, yet our center of the set is greater than 100, and that's because we have an extremely large value, which is sometimes called an outlier, and so our data is skewed right which is why our mean is so large and clearly not representative of the data set. So in this case, you'd likely use the median instead. And first, to find the median, we need to order the data set from lowest to largest. So we'll start with 50.71, followed by 60, then 71.01, 79.62, then 400. And to find the position of the median within the set, we'll use our formula. So the position of the median is equal to 1 half, or 0 0.5, times however many points I have in the set, so in this case that's 5, plus 1. So the position is the third entry, which in this case happens to be 71.01. .01. So my median is equal to $71.01, .01, .01, which is much more accurate, and you can tell clearly, since we're disregarding the value of 400, we have a maximum of around $80, a minimum of 50, and so the halfway point is around 75, or 65, we should say. So our center of our width would be around 65, and our median is at 71, which is much closer than 132. Finally, we could find our mode. In most cases, you would divide your data up into intervals, so maybe 50 to 60, and then 60 to 70, 70 to 80, and then tally up however many points fall into each interval, and whichever has more points you would call your modal class. In this case we only have five data points, and so it wouldn't really be worth it or make much sense to do that. So we'll simply say that we have no mode in this case, which is usually the case for continuous data sets if you don't use this bin method. So that's all we have for our measures of central tendency. After that, we have our measures of spread. And in that case, we can calculate the range of our data set, which is the maximum value. We're going to disregard our outlier of 400. 
since it's not really representative of the values that we have in the set. So we'll use the maximum of 79.62 minus our minimum of 50.71, which gives us a range of $28.91. When we move on to find our variance, we'll add up the square differences between each point and the mean divided by n minus 1, which is equal to 50.71 minus 132.27 squared plus 79.62 minus 132.27 squared plus 60 minus 132.27 squared and then we'll continue with the remaining points. And then we'll divide by however many points there are minus 1. So we have 5 points, we'll divide by 4. And if you plug that into your calculator you'll get a variance of 22,519.78 dollars squared since we squared all our values and you can see that we're in the tens of thousands whereas our set barely even reaches 100 and so the variance isn't really comparable to our data set to find a value that's comparable we'll use the standard deviation or s which is equal to the square root of the variance and so we'll square our value of 22,519.78 to get a value of 150.06 dollars and so the relative spread of our data is around 150.06 and that's mainly due to our outlier which is so large causing such a high spread but you can notice that the value of 150.06 is much more comparable than 22,000. Finally, as an exercise for you, you might want to check that the other calculation or the other expression for the variance, the sum of all the points squared, so square all the points and then add them, minus the number of points times the mean squared divided by n minus 1, verify that that gives you the same answer as the regular formula.